Thank you, Ms. Hubbard, and congratulations on your role in founding, co-founding this organization. We hope that this is but the first of numerous occasions where we can join hands <clears throat> in projects, programs, events, and activities. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, His Royal Highness uh, uh, Zaid Rod Zaid Al Hussein. Uh, this individual embraces in his own uh, focus, uh, professionalism, a host of issues of interest and value and concern and need and objective uh, pertaining to all of those who have come here today. Uh, as Ambassador of Jordan, he was preceded by Karim Kawar, who we made reference to uh, earlier, uh, but was also serving at the United Nations for more than six and a half years as his country's permanent representative to the United Nations, and for four years prior to that as his country's deputy representative to the United Nations with the rank of ambassador. He's been involved in peace uh, keeping, peacemaking, uh, conflict resolution. He has his PhD from Cambridge University in law. He represented uh, Jordan's de delegation to the International uh, Court of Justice, uh, which heard the issue pertaining to Israel's building of the, the wall, um, uh, separating uh, additional areas of the occupied West Bank territories from uh, Israel uh, proper. Uh, and thereby diminishing what would have been the 22 percent remaining of the Palestinian territories <coughs> for a Palestinian state down to 14 uh, percent if, if they are able and lucky to, to obtain that. He's been involved in issues pertaining to justice in international law uh, and was present at the creation of the International Criminal Court uh, for which uh, many Americans have uh, various uh, questions related to uh, public policy. He has been as focused as any of the Arab uh, ambassadors in Washington on the final status questions pertaining to the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, Jordan is one of the two Arab countries that does have a peace treaty uh, with Israel, the other being Egypt. Uh, but Jordan is as concerned as the others with the final status questions of borders, of, of settlements, of Jerusalem's, and refugees, and, and much else. Please join me in welcoming His Royal Highness <coughs> Zayed Rad Zayed Al Hussein. Thank you, John, uh, Catherine, and Andrew, for that uh, very warm uh, welcome. Uh, Cardinal McCarrick, it's an honor to see you here. Uh, my good friend, Ambassador Shukri, I, I hope you'll correct me if I, I go astray in the next few minutes. Uh, I'm delighted to be with so many friends here. Uh, and uh, as you all know so well, uh, I come from a, a, a culture smitten with uh, the love or I should say smitten with speeches, the love for uh, the oral method of communication. Uh, so much so that uh, often after delivering a long speech, uh, I would sit next to my wife and like all men who are vain and insecure, I would look at my wife and feeling confident I would say to her, well, what did you think? And she would give me a look that only a wife can give, and she would say to me, you missed three opportunities to sit down. <laughs> I say this, I say this because yesterday I was sitting with my colleagues in the embassy, and uh, I was mulling over what I would say today. And uh, I came to the conclusion that really there is nothing to say beyond that which could be perceived to be banal or so well trodden by repetition that it is of uh, little interest to an audience. And have not uh, the circumstances uh, of the present with the string of crises that stretches from the Mediterranean uh, to South Asia uh, begun to wind into a knot so complex and so challenging uh, that words almost become meaningless uh, in the face of a fate uh, which we have little choice uh, but to submit to uh, with the recognition or in the recognition that our collective will has brought us 
uh, to or not brought us to a, a defining point. Uh, now, of course, we should uh, take stock of all the recent positive developments that have occurred in the Middle East, and I was reminded of these developments yesterday when I met a group of friends who are journalists. Uh, naturally, the successful formation of the Lebanese government is something to be applauded. The success, successful con conduct of the balloting in Iraq a couple of weeks ago uh, is likewise something that we must uh, take uh, pride in as uh, a people in the Middle East. Uh, of course, the, as we all know, the uh, challenge of putting together a government is, is hugely difficult. Uh, nevertheless, uh, when one uh, appreciates how difficult it was to just hold the election and that all of the work was done by the Iraqis themselves from the security uh, standpoint, from the point of organizing them, I think this is, uh, of course, something that we need to uh, very much uh, appreciate. Uh, there are, of course, signs that the relationship between the United States and Syria are improving, you know, fits and starts, but generally, uh, I think, moving uh, in the right direction. And then, most recently, of course, at the Arab summit uh, that concluded in Libya a few days ago, uh, it was clear that notwithstanding all the pressures uh, uh, placed upon the uh, Arab Peace Initiative, uh, not least by uh, the fact that uh, uh, Israel has yet to embrace it, uh, the Arab commitment to the initiative has remained uh, steadfast. But do we not also recognize that uh, Arabs and Israelis alike, and, and this is really to be considered at the level of government, uh, present a rather sorry uh, picture of ourselves uh, in terms of how we have responded to this conflict. Uh, when one considers the report uh, issued a couple of years ago by the foresight, foresight, uh, sorry, Strategic Foresight Group, the Indian think tank, about the lost earnings for this region uh, since 1991 as a result of the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict. The fact that the estimate was up to $12 trillion lost in earnings, half the potential uh, wealth of the region sort of uh, plowed into weapons and programs either associated with the conflict or uh, as a result of investments lost because of the conflict. Uh, so is it not the case that we can argue that we are a burden onto ourselves and a burden onto the rest of the planet? Are we not also a constant threat to the uh, peace and security of the planet, given the uh, sort of centrifugal forces that can uh, quickly be whipped into uh, some momentum uh, were something to happen, for instance, in Jerusalem, and a point I'll get to uh, shortly. Uh, and so in addition to being a burden, we're a constant threat to the international community. And then finally, one can make the argument that uh, also we are a non-player when it comes to the larger discussions occupying the international community. I cannot think in the last 60 years, and I stand to be corrected, of one initiative, one major initiative divorced from the Middle East, that is, uh, it has nothing to do with anything connected to the Middle East, that the Arabs or the Israelis presented in the form uh, of a solution or an attempt to answer questions, for instance, whether it revolves around grinding poverty around the, uh, the planet, sustainable development, uh, issues of a, of a broader global nature. And I cannot think of one initiative. And so is it not the case that we are a non-player. And if you look at all three of these uh, dimensions, uh, one can argue that we as a region really uh, are a sorry bunch. And uh, perhaps if graded, uh, we would uh, clearly deserve a big F uh, from that perspective. Uh, and then, uh, of course, there is the other question of whether we are truly deserving uh, of a peace, uh, in particular uh, a Middle East peace when one considers uh, the number of opportunities that we have lost, either by design 
or through circumstances since 1967. Uh, can we claim a right to peace uh, when one considers that large segments of one population uh, is so ready to belittle the colossal crime uh, that was the Holocaust, while on the other uh, side there exists a large uh, group of uh, people who cannot yet grasp the effect uh, of an occupation in the degradation of another people, I itself an ignominy. Uh, indeed, uh, are we so deserving of peace when pain or the denial thereof can so easily be traded in our rhetorical exchanges? Uh, are we so deserving of peace when the complex feelings so necessary for peace can uh, be so easily upstaged by the more primitive feelings of fear and insecurity? Are we deserving of peace when we can so easily cede ground to extremists and those with views of the extreme. And perhaps uh, taken from that angle, we may not be so deserving. And yet, uh, as we all know, uh, there are people who continue to suffer fearfully uh, on the one side, while on the other, there are people who are fearful of future suffering. And uh, this situation, as we all know, is simply uh, intolerable. There is also uh, another constituency, a younger generation aspiring uh, to uh, survive our collective stupidity. Uh, they, if they are to solve the broader uh, uh, and more challenging and complex problems uh, facing the globe, then they must find shelter and find it soon uh, in a regional peace uh, which uh, will at, la at long last uh, bring some relief to, to this uh, particular part of the world. Now, Jordan, under uh, His Majesty King Abdullah's uh, leadership, uh, like many, many Arab countries, uh, deeply, is deeply supportive of uh, President uh, Obama's desire to establish peace uh, in our region on the basis of two states uh, living side by side in peace and security. Uh, and we believe that this is entirely doable. Uh, there is, after all, when it comes to peace, nothing that is impossible. In 1995, I was serving uh, with the UN in the former Yugoslavia. And uh, by the time we reached the month of July, I think we were all convinced that uh, there would be conflict and bloodshed in Bosnia for another 10 years. Uh, the fighting was intense by that stage. The weaponry was plentiful. The hatred was very apparent. We had exhausted every permutation of a uh, peace agreement, let alone also uh, ceasefires and cessations of hostilities. And we simply could not see a way out. And if someone had said to us, um, in six months, the fighting would stop, or at least the killing would stop. One can argue maybe the fighting has continued uh, by other means. But the killing would stop. I don't think anyone would have believed it possible, and yet uh, it was possible. And so we are firmly of the belief that uh, were we to act decisively and seize the moment now, uh, that uh, we uh, can uh, achieve something here. And uh, of course, uh, it is clear that uh, we are very close, hopefully, uh, to uh, seeing the beginning of the proximity talks and uh, hopefully uh, soon thereafter we can uh, uh, build upon them. There is, however, the question of uh, Jerusalem, which so occupies uh, the uh, world's attention at the moment. And uh, perhaps I can divide the, uh, the way we see Jerusalem into two parts. Uh, naturally, it holds uh, very deep meaning to all Muslims, as it does to uh, the people of the Abrahamic faiths, all people of the Abrahamic faiths. Uh, 